So exercise was my first exposure to health and fitness. And it was the first time that I felt a sense of personal empowerment and personal agency. I remember um, discovering it when I was in junior high and, and wanting to be like so many insecure teenagers uh, and insecure boys wanting to be big and strong so that I can not get beat up by my big and strong peers so I could be less insecure and ultimately so girls would be into me if I you know had biceps. Those were my those that was my thought process when I was a young man. So I went to being a bookworm and a D&D nerd. I went to the school library and I checked out a the only book they had on uh weightlifting and bodybuilding and it was this hardbound black and white probably probably 60 pages of exercise information written by a bodybuilder from the 70s and it was very simple it was very easy to follow and the the author asked answered a lot of questions that i had about how much i said how much i said exercise how um what lifts i should focus on and how to maximize the results that i could achieve and one of the first sentences that i read in that book was um one of the concepts we'll share today but it talks about maximizing rest to maximizing gains uh and that was true in the 70s and it's true today so uh today we're going to cover why we exercise now um what constitutes appropriate exercise for our goals and the common pitfalls that we're that we meet when we're on our fitness and our health and fitness journey so the number one reason why we perform exercise and an exercise program is to change or create an adaptation to our body so we want to change our body either how it looks or how it feels how it performs we want to change something and uh, a tertiary reason and the probably the number one reason i work out today is the mental health benefits but ultimately the specific reason why we're doing a, a lift or an exercise or a cardiovascular drill is to create a change so the adaptation is the goal of our training program and i want to give you a little analogy on the difference between um, adaptation and in healing and recovery, because a lot of times when people get into their health and fitness journey, they start by you know lifting weights or doing something they haven't done before. Maybe they're you know doing a, a spin class or or running a lot, whatever it is, or yoga, and they they feel soreness and they feel you know an initial bout of uh, delayed onset don, delayed onset of muscle soreness or fatigue and they they it takes some time to recover from that and they begin to associate that with fit health and fitness and the analogy i like to use is creating a callus on your hand when you're when you if i if i were to grab some sandpaper and rub it on your hand over a, a course of time i would wear away the skin eventually i would create a wound right? If I kept every day just rubbing sandpaper on your hand, you wouldn't develop a callus if I continually just rubbed sandpaper on it every single day. You might be healing every day. So you might, some skin might regrow over that wound, but the adaptation, the the thicker, stronger, you know, a, a layer of skin that protects your hand from injury wouldn't happen if I just continually applied applied uh sandpaper to your hand and the adaptation that we want in this analogy is the is the callus to protect your hand but the the, the result that we're getting is a continual open wound and that's really important to remember when it comes to your fitness training program because it's very easy to be in the healing and the recovery process and feel sore and tired all the time but that's not the goal. The purpose of your training is not the is not to be tired and sore. The purpose of your training is to build muscle or improve the function of a joint or improve your endurance and to create this positive outcome 
that you're trying to trying to garner with your efforts. So we want to distinguish between adaptation from our training and the healing and recovery component that we're getting. So I sent out a, um, a, a basic strength training and cardiovascular conditioning program earlier today or yesterday or all the days are blending together in January already. So I, I emailed this document out and it, it outlines a very similar program to the one that I began weight training with, which is lifting total body twice, twice a week for about 45 minutes to an hour to create the adaptation of strength and muscle. And it might seem minimalist if you've been in the fitness space a lot, or you've read a lot of programs, or you've been following a lot of YouTubers, it might seem quite minimalist, but what this type of setup does is maximize the adaptations that you can get from a training program, um, especially in the beginning phase. So if we know what our goal is to create the change, and we've distinguished between adaptation and healing and recovery, which they're similar, and there's a Venn diagram of overlap, but they are different. We're trying to get the adaptation and we must you know, heal and recover from our training. And then we have to figure out how much of each do we need to create the adaptation that we want. And um, this is where we get to the, the, the next component of our, our agenda today, which is figuring out how much of your training should be general and how much of it should be specific to the goals that you're that you've outlined for yourself. So uh the I'm trying to think of a way to organize it in my mind. And I think the best way to think about it is Fitness training is a constant process of finding out what your minimum effective dose is to create the adaptation that you want. So the goal is to minimally increase the intensity or the specificity or the frequency or the time under tension or, or the uh, duration of your bouts of exercise so that you're constantly in an adaptation phase, but not constantly in a healing phase from the training that you're doing. So uh, there's some guidelines, there's some guardrails that we have to know how much is enough and how much is too much. And uh, the way that I, I think I would describe them differently for cardiovascular conditioning and for strength training. For strength training, Oh, oh, I'm giving the thumbs up. So I'm thumbs upping everyone else. Good job. Good job, AI. Um, the For strength training, as, I, as I'm not distracted by myself, for strength training, uh, one hour is sort of the beginning. Uh, one hour per week of training is the beginning where you're going to start to see results broken up into two 30-minute workouts. And three hours is, is closer to the ceiling of what is effective for, for producing meaningful results in a strength training program. So three hours of continuous training. And the reason for that is, is because your joint, every joint system has approximately a ceiling of about 10 sets of strength training that it can adapt from. Remember, adapt from, not heal from. So if you're, if 10 sets is the upper ceiling of number of sets that you can create a positive adaptation from, and five sets is the lower ceiling, then there are many ways that you can spread out a workout or spread your lifting over a course of workouts. You could do three 20-minute sessions of three joint, you know, three exercises per joint complex. Uh, two longer workout sessions of 90 minutes where you're doing more exercises or six 20 minute workouts where you're doing uh, just a few body parts per day, which is a fan that, you know, people who do bro splits or uh, push poles, um, push pull legs, which is a, a common bodybuilding format. There's lots of ways to break up the training in a way that 
you can still adapt from it and it still has a, a, a high degree of effectiveness. And the example that I have given is, is probably the simplest way to do it because most people have the most structure in their lives Monday through Friday. And the, you know, and the opposing days when they're not doing strength training is, are great days to do uh, cardiovascular conditioning when it's cycling or running. But there's um, there's a lot of nuance to the individual when it comes to how much is too much and how much is not enough. If you've gone a few days in a row where you've missed a meal or lost some sleep, it's very easy to cross cross that too much threshold. And after you've been training for a while and you're well rested and you're well mineralized and you're you've been on your nutrition plan, you're feeling really good. Your your body can tolerate quite a bit of stress before you reach that uh, that that threshold of adaptation. So it's no, it's not really a hard and fast rule, but one thing to consider is how you feel while you're training. If the weights are moving easily, the weights you did last week are moving pretty easily and you feel strong and you feel like everything is coming together really well and you're in your training, you feel vital, then that's often signs that you're adapting very well to your training program. However, if the weights that you're lifting are, are difficult and it's very hard to uh, to finish the set, the working sets that you used to accomplish, you know, pretty easily in the week prior, then that might be a sign that you're, you know, you're getting a little fatigued, you're, you're under recovered and that you're, you're in the, you're pushing the healing zone more than you are pushing the adaptation zone, especially if you're that feeling of tired and fatigue and soreness doesn't go away over over a few workouts or uh, um, doesn't go away after a few days. And I also want to distinguish between being tired and sore and really just what I call being cold. Because once you get warmed up, even if you know, your body is not necessarily feeling like it's ready to do a, a, a run or a spin class or a strength training workout, oftentimes when the music turns up, and your heart rate gets a little high and some adrenaline starts pumping and some endorphins get into your system, that that achiness and fatigue start to go away. So always look at your performance in the workout versus how you feel before, before the workout, because you can feel quite tired and quite fatigued, but if your performance is on point and you feel really good during and after, then you're probably fine and things are rolling. Again, you're measuring the adaptation, not necessarily how the body and the mind is feeling because your mood can have a great impact on how heavy or how light things are for you in a particular moment. So we've covered why we exercise, how much strength training is enough and how much could be too much. We're gonna talk a little bit about cardiovascular fitness and yes, uh, it's a great comment. Keep keep the praise coming. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about cardiovascular fitness now, and the rules are are a little bit similar. the The floor when you start to see dramatic improvement from your cardiovascular output or your endurance is around ninety minutes to two hours per week of cardiovascular exercise. That could be broken up in you know almost any way imaginable, but three 30 minute you know activity sessions are a great place to start. Um, I'm a big fan of daily walks and we'll get to that um, those other exercise components here in a second. but uh, th three 30 minute uh, sessions of cardiovascular exercise are a great place to start. And you can go as much as three 90 minute sessions in a week and still get tremendous benefit from them. So that's about, what is that? Um, three, four, four and a half hours of cardiovascular training. And then you still get some results from increased cardiovascular training, but the results, the, the, the input versus output goes, gets a little bit more diminishing returns, takes effect. So every, every extra 30 minutes, every extra hour or every unit of time that you put in after that four, four and a half hour mark, that's when you're still going to start to see a little bit less improvement. But obviously athletes train daily 
And some athletes do two a days and get great uh, cardiovascular and, and fitness results from as much as eight to 10 hours a week, which is about the ceiling of, you know, recreational athletes. After about 10 hours, the increased amount of activity that you pile on to your program are, is, is not necessarily going to be bad for you, but it's just not going to produce the adaptation that the, that the first few hours did when you started your fitness program. So it is a little bit of, um, it's a little bit disappointing if you're someone who likes exercise, but if you're also somebody who's been exercising for a while, like me or like Tanya or like Kayla, then you're probably just going to feel really good when you move your body, no matter whether it's for the most efficient or effective workout, or if it's just for mental health or for fun. So there's a lot of benefits to exercise. They're more dramatic for the first five hours. They're a little bit less dramatic for the next three or four. And then after that, it's really just about balancing your quality of life with the amount of time that you have available to exercise. But the measure of success is always what are the results you're getting for what the level of effort that you're putting in to your health and fitness. Ah. I love talking. I forget about how fast I can go through things. Oh. Um, I have a question if I could follow up on that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's about the strength training component. What's the best way to determine how much dumbbell weight I should start with? I noticed in the videos you shared with us in the um, example training program, a lot of them include dumbbells. What's the best way to determine where I should start with that? Great question. And if you're brand new to a program like this, I would continue, I would use your opportunity to test as a warm up and as a practice, practice sets. So if you're brand new to overhead press and you pick up a five pound dumbbell or an eight pound dumbbell or whatever your gym has, and you do those reps and it feels like you could do five or 10 more when you get to the end, just go ahead and count that as a warm up, and then move on to the next set and increase to the next size dumbbell. And you'll know what dumbbells bright for you when finishing rep eight feels a little bit of a challenge. And like you could do one or two more reps, but you couldn't do three or four. Well, great question, That's Kayla. That's helpful. That's actually, it's not, thank you for asking it. Cause honestly, I haven't been working out a lot with strength lately. I'm just barely getting back to all of it. So to be honest, but what I've been doing, I haven't done the top, my uppers, except for push-ups. but for the bottom, I've just been doing my body weight. And so like this week, my goal was to be consistent using my body weight only. And I did split squats, regular squats. And then those like things where you squat down with a band between your thighs, like wrapped around your thighs, they go sideways, like a, you know, like that. Um, just, I want to show myself I can do it for three times this week, you know, three sets of 10, three times this week. And yes. like, the next week I'll do weight, but, <laughs> but I like what you said, because I never know, like, should I be doing five, three sets of 10 with five pounds or eight or 12 or what? So it's a helpful rule. That's, um, that's, it, it, it's a great, um, that's a great point. And I'm glad that you asked that, Kayla. And whenever, whenever, whenever I feel like the amount of weight that I'm moving is a little too humble or too small, that's probably the right amount for me. Uh, the that's that there's nothing wrong. It's easier to start slow and feel confident about your next workout than it is to uh, take a too a too large of a bite and regret and even dread the gym the next day. So it's important. The momentum, that's what this is all about. It should be easy to, you're, you should feel like you're running downhill, not like you're running uphill for your progress on this journey. So great question. Um, I'm trying to think of was there another question that was asked. Oh, and um, I meant to talk about um, which exercises you should be doing and um, how much of each. So uh, basically your training should just reflect your goals. Like, um, Tanya, it sounds like you have some clarity on where you're starting from and what success looks like for you. 
And if you want to, within reason, if you want to see more upper body strength, you should put emphasis on your upper body. If you want to see more lower body strength, put emphasis on your lower body with a caveat that once you've lifted each body part twice per week, that you have dramatically less results by going more than that. So if you have a, a trouble area that you want to focus on, you can add an extra day or a few extra exercises and that's great. Um, and as long as you're not double tapping or you're not you're hitting it more than twice a week, you're generally going to be pretty successful. Um, that was about can strength ask, training. Can I ask an application question of that? So if like, let's just say I'm going to try and run three days a week, then on those days, maybe just do upper body. If I want to do two of those days as upper body days, even just one of them, right? If I'm just going to do one day a week of each right now, and then on the days I don't run, do the lower body one or two times. Great. I love that. that. Like how to distribute that properly. Cause I did always kind of struggle with that when I started running again, I was like, when do I, now, when do I lift weights, you know, and um, it's harder. That, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a great, um, that's a great question. And uh, uh, in general, if you're one of your, if you want to see your running improve, which you probably do. You don't want to run after you lift weights. You will have a dramatically different run. You probably already know this than you you would uh, without it. So, um, and marrying upper body with a running day is perfect. And um, keeping a leg day uh, or legs as a separate event um, is totally fine. Um, are you running? How many times a week are you running? Did you say? Between well, about three. Like if I'm being consistent, I'm, you know, again, that kind of just back to it, but three is my goal this week. It will be Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. Great. Uh, um, I, I like that. And, you know, um, if three, I think three days a week, if you're feeling like that's ambitious, then setting the bar at two and then having three is a bonus. But I think that that's perfect. Giving yourself lots of room and you can move that around as your schedule needs. And then, yeah, you get one weight training day for legs, one weight training day for upper body or two for upper body or however you want to marry that with your running, like you said. I think um, that's totally fine. So perfect. So um, when it comes to cardiovascular training, um, I'm a big fan of zone two, which is kind of boring, but very simple. Just basically being able to do moderate intensity for longer periods of time. And I think I already said this, but 30 minutes is a great place to start. 45 is amazing. And if you're doing three 45 minute bouts per week, you're doing great. Um, what does zone two mean? Zone two just means that your heart rate isn't, you're not in an anaerobic threshold. It means your level of effort is below a seven out of 10 or that you can breathe through your nose while you're, while you're running. And, um, if you can do both of those things, if you feel like you have extra gas in the tank and you can still breathe through your nose, that's probably a zone two. And, and your, if you're wearing, um, an Apple watch, your heart rate will be between 130 and 140. I, I haven't seen zone two in a little while. <laughs> like, zone two is me walking around my house. No, it's gay. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't my, the other day I was running and I noticed I was like 162. And I thought, oh, that's not bad. Like, you know, because I can get to like 180 when I'm on a hill or something. And I was like, oh, 160, it's fine. And it did, it actually did feel fine. It didn't feel, you know, like I couldn't. Like too much? Something. Well, that's, well, that's, yeah. that, there's nothing wrong. That makes total sense. Um, when I started uh, zone two training, I could only do it for seven minutes before I had to walk. So uh, you're, you're right on par with everybody else. So, so uh, consistency is key, Tanya. Vitamin I'm C. I'm going to try that today. I'm at, I'm going running right after this, and I'm going to try and run two miles and do the 130, which means I'm going to have to probably go pretty slow. But that's yeah. okay. That's yeah. not only is that okay. You're going to feel better when you're done running than when you started, and it'll be easier to tackle your next run. Are you sensing a theme? Is anyone sensing a theme here? You feel better when you're done. You probably did the right amount of training. Yeah. 
So that's what I, and that's what I want for everybody. Great. These are great questions. These are perfect questions. And um, I, uh, I'm looking at the, the workout program. Yeah. You, you've got between that, uh, what we've talked about on Monday and your meal plan and your workout plan, you've got a lot of really important details. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to talk about how to calendar everything in a way that makes sense so that it's really easy to organize your your prep, your recovery, your training. Yeah. So can we go through it tomorrow? Like I have, I literally have this and I just did this week just because promised myself I would schedule it but I would love that for us Kayla then we could go like okay so it's a run day so we know it's an upper day and it's a walking day so we know we can do a lower day or whatever right or just even take it off and just do a lower day I really need that so I'm bringing this tomorrow <laughs> good yeah good well good keep, keep it right there keep it with you and uh we're, we're gonna go over that and I'm gonna do my best to share all of my secret and my hacks in terms of how to schedule things to where they're going to be the most effective and the easiest to manage. So um, we'll get into all that and you can uh, the, bring your specific questions for our workshop tomorrow. But um, if you don't have any, if nobody has any more questions, I'm going to let Tanya go for a run. I'm so excited. I can't wait. I actually can't wait. I'm like 130. I can, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Sue. Thanks for telling me about that. How did I know? <laughs> Good to see you guys. Bye, you Tanya. too. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye.